Good morning, Danielle. It's so nice to see you today. How are you? Good morning. I am doing well on this bright and early Monday morning. <laughs> it is a bright and early Monday morning. I am curious, do you have any ways that are like part of your routine of getting into the week? Is it a special coffee? Do you do something unique on the Monday morning to kind of just gear into motion? What is that like for you? I mean, I think I dream of having some like really <laughs> cathartic morning ritual, but at this point in my life, it is my alarm going off, me waking up with like a pillow crease on my face, running downstairs, walking the dog. Um, I have three young children, so it usually involves like waking them up for something. Um, a couple of them like to run cross country, so I usually have to wake them up and drive them to practice during the summertime. So yeah, it's, the day starts out pretty quickly around our house. So I think I'm kind of, <laughs> like I, I said, that. when. <laughs> Yeah, <laughs> I do yeah. aspire someday to like wake up with a you know cup of tea and read the paper, um, but that not at that moment. That there. we dream of with the crossword. Every <laughs> right. One I day, I think there's this trending term right now, like coastal grandmother or something. Like that's a beautiful idea. <laughs> like the yeah. nice PJs. One day we'll all get there, maybe. <laughs> no, just waiting for that moment to become Ina Garden and just like wander around my garden with a cup of coffee. <laughs> oh my gosh, I'm here for it. I want to go buy, maybe I'll just go to the local like fruit stand and get some cherry tomatoes and like close my eyes. <laughs> Right. Cool. I'm just like sniff the fruit. Yeah. <laughs> there we go. But I'm so glad that we're here in the meantime. Um, for anyone who doesn't know you, this is Danielle Hatch, artist and community arts programmer. Um, so I'm really excited to break down what that means for you and show off some of your really cool work um, that I encountered in Bentonville while living there. So thank you for being here today. Well, thanks for having me. I'm looking forward to chatting with you. Awesome. So I'd love to start at the beginning, um, kind of, you know, what were you like, Danielle, as a kid? Did you always know you were going to be playing with these ideas of femininity and domesticity and everything? Like, where did your creative passions kind of come into the story? Um, I'd love to hear more of that background. Sure. So um, let's see. What was I like as a kid? I think I was giving this a little thought yesterday, and I think I was always really interested in just um, sort of taking ownership of the spaces that I inhabited. Um, my mom, so I was raised by a single mom in Southern California and we moved around a lot. I think I went to like six different elementary schools. So it was almost like a yearly thing of moving and getting into new apartments. And, uh, but we, my mom did a great job of just like anytime we would move, just immediately unpacking everything, hanging up art on the walls. Like she was very purposeful in the way that to kind of organize the space. And I think I, I sort of um, grasped onto that as well. I was someone that was always like, every three months I would completely rearrange the furniture in my bedroom, you know, and just sort of using space as a way to like, I don't know, think about shifting like persona or identity. Also just this opportunity to sort of remake yourself as you go to a new place. That was something that I kind of liked as a kid. I liked going to a new school and thinking like, I could be anyone I want to be here. Um, <laughs> I don't know if that connects to like some of the performative work that I do, but that that's how I kind of experienced my childhood, um, which was a little therapeutic, but um, yeah. And then, um, so I, like I said, I was raised by a single mom. I went to a women's college. So I think just sort of navigating life through this um, a little bit of a, a gendered lens um, was something that um, that I don't know that I had like really I don't know um, purposefully examined maybe until I got to college but that was definitely the sort of reality of how I experienced um, you know just power dynamics within my home and just the way that I, I navigated the world and space um, was through that sort of gendered identity of like femininity and um, kind of what that meant evolved over time. But, um, but yeah, so I think I can definitely tie a lot of those things into just childhood moments, I guess. But um, yeah, I, and then I'm trying to think just like once I got to, to school, um, kind of like 
arts, which um, I originally had wanted to be a lawyer. Um, <laughs> so I was a political science major until my, my junior year when I took an architecture class that I just fell in love with um, and realized that, you know, these were things that I just intuitively was drawn to this examination of like the spaces that we inhabit. And so, and so I switched my major, but but still like very interested in sort of this, like notions of power um, that you can, you know, sort of examine through the political realm and wanting to understand that better. And I think, I mean, place making and power, there's certainly a <laughs> a bit of uh, a connection between those two things. And so, um, yeah, and then from architecture to art was kind of, um, I, well, I went to a, a liberal arts college. So um, my architecture courses were a lot of sculpture, studio art, and architectural history. I took a few drafting classes at MIT, but Wellesley did not um, offer any specific like architectural um, drawing courses or anything like that. So really, I felt like I began to kind of create these site-specific installations as a way of um, kind of that initial examination of architectural spaces that you do in architecture school where you go and do a site visit and, and see how people move through the space, um, you know, research the history of the place. I found that art just maybe offered me a little more freedom to kind of delve into those things that excited me. Mm. So it was a quick a quick foray into architecture and then <laughs> and then went to graduate school for uh, sculpting. Oh my gosh, what a cool journey. Thank you for like breaking it down like so succinctly um, and really all encompassing. Um, and I love what you mentioned about even um, maybe like the power or the opportunity for newness that comes from moving the stuff around in your space. Like I um, totally relate to that, but never really thought about it before, like how powerful that is. And then to get to go to those different schools throughout your time as a, like a child, you know, in social work, we think about these stages of development. There's so many like back to back to back ones when you're in that age range that to get to go insert yourself and have a purposeful like reset. Um, I can see how that would be a really helpful part of, of that time of growing up, even though it's maybe different than what a lot other, um, what other people might experience. And then um, so you mentioned this like um, kind of section of time where you thought law might be your route. And from there you pivoted to um, architecture, was it? Mm -hmm. How did you decide to make that first pivot? Like I understand maybe architecture to art, but how did you decide <laughs> law to architecture? Yeah, uh, that's a great question. I mean, it really was one class that I took um, just again, liberal arts education, I had to take like a humanities class. And so I chose um, 19th and 20th century architecture with Alice Friedman, who's just a fantastic scholar and an amazing professor. And it was really just the magic of one, one course in, in college that I, like, I found myself so excited to go to class. So just like, you know, like a silly smile on my face throughout the whole lecture, just and yeah, it was over the course of that um, that class that I just realized, no, this is what I want to do. This is what this is where I want to be. Like, I mean, I'm someone that loves education, but that's like it doesn't get any better than that than being in a class where you think like this is speaking to who I am, to my interests. Um, you know, the professor is incredibly engaging, and it just it was like a, a, a magical four months or <laughs> yeah. I don't even know that I got like a great grade in the class but I just I just love being there I love the subject matter so much and so it was kind of a a big shift but also not I mean I'd always been interested in like, creativity but never like, considered myself or hadn't considered architecture it wasn't um, I didn't know anyone that was an architect it was in a world that I grew up in where you had the you know autonomy to like design, you know, spaces from the, the ground up, I would say, you know, sort of lived in the domestic sphere of like interior design, but not, you know, really considered what, what the actual like structure of the building meant and who, you know, lived in that world. So I guess it was just maybe my first um, kind of exposure to that as a possibility. So, so yeah. cool. 
I think it was so important that you chose to lean into that. Like you didn't ignore that you were really loving this class and smiling goofy all the time um, just for the sake of staying the course you were already on. Like that pivot seems like it was really important for then getting to even find your niche within the world of place and creative practice and stuff. And um, it seems like you continue to get to go down the rabbit hole into your special like place of installation and sculpture and, and all of those things. Um, you mentioned that, you know, art was maybe an opportunity to be less inhibited by rules or specific expectations. Can you speak to more of like how that comes up in architecture versus how it doesn't come up in art? Sure. Yeah, I guess for me, I sort of this notion of permanence was a little not frightening to me, but almost overwhelming this this sense of like building something that would exist, you know, which which is interesting because so much of architecture these days is um, at least as a lot of buildings that I see in the US, there's not a sense that it will, you know, last beyond maybe 50 years. Um, but, but at the time and thinking about creating things that have this, I don't know, it just, it almost felt oppressive to me trying to design something that I foresaw like existing beyond like my lifetime or something. And, and it wasn't really um, what interested me so much as like maybe exploring the, the emotions of a place, something that was less like, um, physically present, but more sort of emotionally experienced in a space. And so I found that like engaging with that experience through like temporary interventions maybe spoke to that a little bit more, like the the essence of what I what I was really interested in within a space. Um, so yeah, it just sort of was a like intuitive kind of path away from wanting to think about, um, yeah, just structures as much as like um, thinking a little more broadly about what space could be and how it could be experienced. Um, Love that. Um, thank you for explaining it. So you got your BA in architecture, right? And then you um, kind of continued to build your understanding of spaces and how you could op occupy them with your master's degree. Yeah, so I, I went to UC Santa Barbara for graduate school and there um, at the time, I think it, it may still be called this, but the, I studied sculpture, but the um, name of the like major, I guess, was spatial studies, which I appreciated the sort of like yeah. larger umbrella um, in that title. And um, so it really just, it was a free flowing place, UC Santa Barbara when I was there. <laughs> you could sort of do anything you wanted. Um, and so, yeah, I really just kind of continued to sort of examine space through research, through my own like physical, emotional experience of a space. Um, and it was a little bit of a different experience in that um, like Wellesley, my undergraduate experience was very like nurturing very hands-on you sort of like you know go have dinner at a professor's house like there's 12 people and then I went to a, a large state school where you're just sort of like thrown in and really have to navigate um your own path so that that took some time but also just um allowed me a little bit of freedom to just try some new things in terms of um you know just deciding to do some, um, you know, large scale public pieces there and um, which I'd started to do a little bit as an undergraduate, but, um, but yeah, it's, I just, again, kind of delved more deeply into um, just trying to understand this new place that I was in as well, which was a little bit of a coming home for me since I grew up in the area in Southern California. So it was a little bit of like, researching the place, but also maybe tying in my own like experience of having grown up in that environment. Um, a lot of times I love to like connect with individual like um, historical narratives of women. So like I became really interested in this like wealth 
the landowner in Santa Barbara named Lillian Child, who um, owned the site where the zoo is now located and had like just a, a really fascinating history. So I loved just like spending time in the, you know, Santa Barbara Historical Society doing research. <laughs> but then also like going to the um, community college sewing class and spending hours there with like a lot of older women um, that, you know, would go year after year to like make dresses for their granddaughters, make quilts. And that was like another environment that I spent a lot of time in. Um, I kind of folded sewing into my practice a little bit more purposely in graduate school. So yeah, just that ability to connect with the, the community that I was in in Santa Barbara was really important to the work that I was making. Yeah. Sorry, that's really that. meandering answer. No, for you, but. so good. I think this is a beautiful way to um, tap into these different like histories that were happening in, in this space. And it seems like just being there was a spatial study like in itself um, while you were earning this degree. Um, I went to some of the interform sewing workshops in Springdale when I was doing my thesis and I was asking like specific questions, but I also just got to chat with these um, slightly like older women from different parts of the world. And it's such a beautiful thing what sewing does for just enabling conversation. I can imagine it was so special to be in those sewing classes um, in, in California. Definitely. And this sort of intergenerational like sharing of knowledge about life, but also like how to thread the serger. Like you just, I love that sort of, you know, interplay back and forth of, um, yeah, of just everyone having this moment of creativity and then also like sharing knowledge was really lovely. Yeah. And even to just, um, I love, you know, too, you got really into this one woman, right? Whose land became the zoo. Like what a great way to learn history to make it more personal to that individual and their life and how they were navigating that space. Um, if there's not, are there books about this person? I feel like there needs to be. So um, there should be because, so uh, the other thing that I sort of glommed on to is Santa Barbara is such a weird place right now for housing. Like you're either sort of, you know, have millions of dollars or you're in the service industry and there's like not much in between. And so, unless you're a student maybe, um, but she was someone that um, allowed um, during the great depression, um, she allowed a group of gentlemen to start a um, like homeless encampment on her property and it became known as Childville. So like they built these sort of um, makeshift structures and they have like a mayor and a little like mini city government. Yeah, just really fascinating, fascinating history and sort of shielded them from like, um, you know, being bothered by like local authorities and things like that, but also like wouldn't allow any women to live there, which was interesting. So yeah, you just, I think feel like in looking back at history, inevitably you come upon these like moments, of, like points of connection and sort of allows me to kind of better navigate where I am at this moment and trying to understand like, I don't know, the, sort of the same as it ever was, I guess, in some ways, or, you know, identifying areas of progress, but also just realizing that so many contemporary issues are are things that have been, you know, issues and um, just battles that have been going on for a long time, which is yeah. kind of nice in some ways <laughs> to locate yourself within like a larger spectrum of, of that history. Yeah, there is some comforting that comes from the world has seen these patterns before and we find a way through them. And I think um, it was so meaningful that you chose to make your education really um, specific to the place you were, right? I think other students could have maybe said, I'm just studying sculpture here and I'm going to pick at things from all over the world kind of um, ambiguously. Um, but it seems like you really learned from the place you were in, in addition to like the degree you were earning. And just, that's really cool. Um, so did you have, you know, a sense of what your style and approach to your work was going to be going into that program? Or did it come, did you gleam that from your time in your master's program? How did, how do we get to this next step of the kind of work that you do now? Right. I wish that I was someone that was very sort of purposeful <laughs> and like writing manifestos for myself and then like <laughs> charging forward with this like, you know, radical notion in mind. But I think 
for me, a lot of it is just um, like slow, intuitive change over time. Again, based on where I'm living, based on my my life experiences at the time. So I would say a lot of the work that I make now um, relates to the fact that I have I have young children that I you know that I passed through this period of. Um, I took about like five years off of making art um, because I have a couple of children on the autism spectrum and that just required an incredible amount of time and, um, you know, just caregiving and support. And so that was a, a huge sort of paradigm shift in, in approaching art as I came back into it, like this notion of being a caregiver and, and what that looks like. And then just the isolation of domestic space um, when you're sort of in that, in that period of your life where you are, you know, caring for young children. So I think my work has really evolved, again, just based on, on those experiences that I've had at various, you know, moments in my life. So I think it's, it's still very much about connecting to space and place, but, but through the lens of like, again, gender, but also just being a, a primary caregiver for other, for other humans and what that looks like. Um, spatially, emotionally, all of those things. So yeah, it's it's more of a, I would say like gentle transition for me, how my work evolves just along with my own personal evolution, less less a, um, an idea of this is what art needs to be um, for me at least. I love that. And the gentle transition, I'm going to um, try to embrace. I think it's a really wonderful <laughs> concept of just letting your life and who you are and how you approach the world kind of evolve with what you learn and who you meet um, along the way. So you, um, you know, um, on your website, I think it says you do like performance, installation and sculpture. I wonder if you could break down like how those things are, are different and how they kind of like fit together into your story right now. Sure. Yeah. So I think performance is something that is a little more recent for me. And um, I would say that like maybe evolved out of this um, practice of like bringing um, fabric and clothing into my sculptural practice, because then that inevitably like, or maybe not inevitably, but it began involving the human body and like sort of wearing these sculptural forms. And then you know, just starting to think more purposefully about that connection. And um, I grew up in a um, in a household where my my mom was Mormon and you know raised her children Mormon, and then my father was Catholic. And so there was a lot of sort of ritual involved in that. Um, we were very very church going folks, and so there's just um, this notion of like the body sort of performing these things over time and the meaning that is is gathered from that that was really important to me and I think um, performance sort of allowed me an opportunity to kind of find some freedom within those narratives that I um, sort of presented with in terms of like worldviews and things um, you know when I began to feel a little bit of like you know pangs of dissonance within like those stories that were sort of told um, and art really like performance specifically allowed me the freedom to just maybe begin to think about telling different stories um, telling stories that felt more um, more truthful to me to my um, which is not to say that they're like didactic but you know maybe stories that ask questions or that just explore things that were you know in my heart and in my mind at that time. And so I'm really thankful for the um, for that opportunity. I don't know that I initially like named it as doing that, but it definitely allowed me a freedom to just begin to think about creating rituals that were that were meaningful to me um, outside of like prescribed, you know ways of like engaging with spirituality and the body. So I wouldn't say it's like, necessarily a spiritual practice but maybe it is for me just this idea of um of thinking purposefully about the way that my body moves through space and also a lot of the performances that I do are sort of 
communal endeavors involving many women. Um, that's always been a source of like strength and joy for me is female friendship. And, um, and so that's something that I, I incorporate and I explore like in my performative work. Um, so yeah, that's kind of a little bit of background about that. Um, but I, again, it's, I appreciate that sculpture sort of encompass, can encompass a lot of things, this sort of cre creating three-dimensional objects is, is something that can be, you know, site specific. It's something that can engage with the body. Um, it can be like interactive and tactile, which I love. Um, I think that's something that I try to lean into in my work is this sense of engagement with the body, um, that it's not just a visual connection, um, but it can be like a, a tactile connection as well. Yes, I had um, not really been privy maybe to the expansiveness of what sculpture can be. So I really appreciate that like insight. And then um, is installation and sculpture, can they be used interchangeably in some instances? Is there a difference that you appreciate in those terms? Um, what is that like? That's a good question. And I, there's probably like a better definition than I can give, but, but I'll say for my own practice, when I think about installation, it, it is often a little bit more um, connected to place and maybe less of a sense of permanence for me. So it's um, a lot of my installations are sort of ephemeral, temporary um, things. Whereas I think sculptural work, um, Gosh, does it, I'm trying to think if it really relates more to the sort of notion of like permanence and like a, a static thing. I don't know that it does necessarily. So maybe those two things are sort of bleeding into each other a little bit more. Um, but I guess when I started, um, for me, an installation was something that, I mean, it could be an acoustic experience. It could be an olfactory experience. You know, it wouldn't necessarily need to be something um, tactile and three-dimensional, whereas, um, you know, a sculpture, yeah, I guess that's a, that's a good, <laughs> a good question. It's a constant thing, I'm sure, but I just, I mean, to hear <laughs> in your words, I, I think that's a great definition. <laughs> uh, again, I need to be better about sort of like, writing, I don't know, or even just defining things for myself. But I think so often with me, they all just sort of bleed together. <laughs> that's right. Like it's messy, um, not perfectly in boxes, right? There is this fluidness. And that's why we're in art, maybe in not architecture, right? There's it all kind of comes together. Um so I, I also will look at some of your works, but even before that I wanted to just understand more about the materials you use because I think that is so cool and intentional also. Yeah, so um, I would like, I sort of began making sculptural forms using the materials of like architectural model making, which was kind of nice because again, it was like a little bit of freedom to kind of um, explore uh, just maybe non-traditional sculpture materials. Although at this point, like sculpture is pretty wide open for any material, but um, yeah, so I, I remember we did a project where we had to like cast um, the ins, like we had to create a, a model of a, an Italian church and then like cast the interior um, in plaster, which is sort of like relates to like the sculptor Rachel White Reed, um, but just thinking about like negative space as its own form. And so I began playing around a lot with um, doing plaster casting of like the body, but then just using like the mold as the um, as the actual like sculptural object, um, and then really just a lot of it came down to just um, using whatever resources were at hand. So I I started using paper, like recycling. Um, we had these like paper trays in our cafeteria in college, and I would collect those and start making paper pulp out of them. I loved what name it that had some sort of like history of human contact or like experience that was like embedded in that. So, you know, something that you were eating on, something that engaged with like the human hand um, was always really appealing to me. Um, just again, for that, that emotional quality of like 
having engaged with a, a life and a lived experience. I think that that really is embedded in materials um, and in objects. And so I'm trying to think, um, and then again, like moving like to graduate school and thinking about um, utilizing fabric and clothing. Um, I think it, it went to this like notion of like, spheres where maybe women had some um, some autonomy or um, you know I think there was a history I suppose to connect with of like um, you know textile design um, just this kind of um, notion of like creating identity through clothing was always very interesting to me and so wanting to explore that more and then connecting that to like upholstery and like <laughs> the human body to the house and how those like things, um, you know, influence one another, how, how we sort of design our spaces, but how we, you know, emotionally react to the spaces that we are in. And so just began to kind of wanting to tie those things together. But I've, I've always felt a lot of freedom in um, materially, which I appreciate, I think, it really just um, would come down to like maybe a narrative or a story that like suggested a material to me and then just kind of dive into that. And um, so like a piece that I did in Bentonville, um, I started using this ruffled form um, just because of a, a quote that I had read about um, this local gov government being called the petticoat government. And I sort of like latched onto that phrase. Like, wow. Oh. Yeah, and so I started thinking about the ruffled form and like what that meant, like metaphorically, this idea of like softness and beauty um, and then wanting to play with that as like structural component instead of just like an additive thing. Um, but yeah, a lot of times like my material choices will come from like strange places, but then they sort of, once I start working with a material, it can kind of evolve from there. Um, but yeah, it's, it's not anything super, um, like, again, it's all very intuitive. <laughs> yeah, but so. so satisfying when you have that, like, petticoat government moment that leads you to this ruffled situation. Yeah. Like, I just think that's so exciting to see where the path um, kind of takes you in your research. Um, and I'm curious, so um, I've seen your work, like, in the public space. I have seen some photos of your work online. Is the goal um, that these works be experienced in ways that are, you know, accessible for all? Is the goal to sell photographs of the performances? Like, how does how does that kind of come up, or how do you view that kind of part of who gets to be part of this experience? Sure. Um, well, it's definitely not to sell because I that is not my forte. <laughs> so you'll have to interview another artist to tell you about how to. Yeah, I didn't see the add to cart option. <laughs> how to be financially stable. That's <laughs> that's not my realm. But um, no, it is for me, it is about an experiential, like physical um sort of yeah, interaction with the the material, with the the sculpture, with the installation. I really that's where a lot of my like my heart in a project goes into that and I've sort of had to just become a little more purposeful about documenting work because in, in the beginning I just would sort of like snap a few photos myself but the sort of month that the piece was installed really was like the life of the thing to me um and so but that led to just some really bad photographs <laughs> so I'm trying to be more thoughtful about documenting things but yeah I think for me, um, but I will say, like, in doing that recently, like, it's become its own, like, form of creativity, um, like, so I did a performance in the um, desert in eastern Nevada, and that was, like, my Artist 360 project, and it was me and eight other women just in this completely isolated landscape, and wow. the way I did work with a, a friend who was a, um, a filmmaker to record that performance but even as we were doing the performance I sort of said 
you know, if this drone like gets blown away and crashes into a mountain, I'm okay with that. Like if it, if it is just the performance with me and eight other women and that's all it ever is, like that is okay. But, but it became a really beautiful like collaborative process to like work on the film afterwards and um, have the opportunity to collaborate with another um, Arkansas uh, musician to do like the soundtrack and that like so it sort of evolved into this other like lovely creative experience so I shouldn't diminish this like notion of like um you know recording things but but a lot of my like intention and kind of thought process is is involved in like experiencing something physically in the present um but kind of now just being a little more purposeful about about documentation as well yeah, um, both seem very valid and exciting. And um, I'm curious about so those physical experiences. Um, do they come about by um, like what are they called? Like requests for proposals that you submit, or are you identifying like this would be such a cool place to do this thing? Let me reach out to this organization. I'd love to hear more about that. Yeah. So when I started, it was really like wanting to do these more large scale like installations. It was really just like, what what networks am I a part of? So like at, at Wellesley College, it was like, well, I'm a student here, and so it was calling like the museum and asking like, could I do an installation on the outside of this building? Like they didn't ask me to by any means, <laughs> um, but it was kind of lovely. Like so, I that one was a, a learning experience for me too because I talked to someone in the facilities team and they said like no you could never hang something on the side of the building that wouldn't work but then I was I was taking an art history class um, that was led by the director of the museum who was a really lovely man and he had seen some of my other like sculptural work and so I told him you know I really want to hang this thing off the side of the building and he and he was like sure go ahead do it so that was like a, <laughs> a lovely moment of realizing um just sort of how some bureaucracies can work. Like if you can get buy-in from the top, then everyone else is like, okay, we'll do this thing. But um, so that gave me like the confidence to just sometimes keep asking um, if you first get a no. Um, although sometimes it is just no and you have to move on. But, um, but yeah, so really just, I started doing these installations in space where I had some access to it. And um, yeah, again, I would sometimes just sort of pop things down in places <laughs> in the beginning and, and not ask permission to. Um, but again, these were spaces that I inhabited each day. I sort of had a, an under, understanding of like, um, yeah, or a feeling of connection and ownership of the space in some way. Um, and then more recently, like just, you know, starting out again by doing work on my own home, because this was a space that I had some, you know, some autonomy, some control, but then also like um, during COVID, there were some, you know, calls for local artists in Bentonville for um, public works. And that was the first like municipal, well, I had done temporary exhibitions, I should say, in like a transit building um, once before, but this was like the first sort of semi-permanent um, piece that I had done. And so that was a really interesting experience to just kind of navigating that process of, again, proposing a work for the side of the building, which they initially accepted. And then, you know, many layers of like city government later, they said, no, you cannot hang anything on a building. So, <laughs> so then it became, can you put something in a park? Um, which maybe it's my like changeability, but you know, after the initial like oh, disappointment, just kind of leaning into like, okay, what, what can this look like at a park? What can that be? You know, how can that be its own thing? And um, yeah, so, and then from that, it sort of opened up other opportunities again for these like calls for artists. Um, and this last fall, I had the, the opportunity to be on the campus redesign team for the Jones Center, which was really lovely. Um, even uh, as I was saying that like, you know, the permanence of architecture is like, was a turn off me. I also love architecture to this day. So it was a real pleasure to, um, to work with the architects and the landscape architects on that team and just 
um, be kind of immersed in that language again. Um, so yeah, that was that was a flashback to like the Wellesley architecture class of like, oh, I do love this. This is really like wonderful to talk to other architects. Um, so yeah, I this spring I proposed my first like permanent installation. So we'll see. Um, the, they're still voting on the budget for that, but that would be like three kind of large outdoor pieces um, for the Jones Center in Springdale. So okay. yeah, it's really like evolved from these sort of like makeshift, like throwing something up and hoping no one throws it away to like, yeah, being a little more, having a little more authorization, I would say. <laughs> or like, um, yes. Yeah. Oh, that's so exciting. I hope you'll keep me posted about the Jones Center one. It'd be a great excuse for me to come take a trip back and visit yeah. everything. Um, so I look forward to that. And without further ado, we can dive into some of the work that you've already put in the world, which is awesome. Um, so I went as far back in the archive as I could. Um, and I'm excited to kind of go chart this course with you to the present. So um, I'd love to hear more about what this is, where this is, how it came to be kind of stuff. Sure. So this is a, a piece from my uh, senior year at Wellesley. This is a personification of some virtue that is outside of the library. And I forget which one it is, maybe wisdom. Um, <coughs> but yeah, so we were doing some, some casting in bronze at the time in my, <laughs> in my sculpture classes. And I was thinking about this, like, so just again, the, the female body as like, you know, a metaphor for things. And um, like in my religious background, there's a lot of emphasis on like the perfectibility of the body or the perfectibility of like the mind. And so at this time I had discovered that like a huge number of like my family members had had plastic surgery and I, I didn't know that. Yeah, um, I'm not always the sharpest tack. So like, when I found out, it was like, oh. So I just sort of like, yeah, I wanted to explore, like, here, the statue was, I think, donated by the class of, like, 1885 or something like that, um, so just thinking about, like, how had our, our notions of, like, the female body changed over a period of time, and I think there was, like, some TV show on at the time of, like, you know, people getting plastic surgery, this was, like, the, you know, mid, like, 2000 to 2010s, um, so yeah, just thinking about this idea of like perfectibility within the human body. So I, I went to a local plastic surgeon and they loaned me some breast implants and I cast them, <laughs> which was also a, like, again, a nice community experience, like getting to know your local plastic surgeon and talking to them about art was really interesting. <laughs> so yeah, these are two um, breast implants that I had cast in bronze. And then I, um, I titled it like a gift of the class of 2005 as an enhancement to the gift of the class of 1885. Um, so this was like one of those rogue pieces where I put it up for about a month outside of the library and no one took it down, which was nice. So I still have those breast implants with their little hanger. So it can be added to another piece someday. But yeah, that was again, me just sort of playing around with these these spaces that I inhabited each day, these sculptures that I walked across, you know, or walked past um, and wanting to like provide some contemporary context, I guess. Oh, it is ingenious. Did you get to see people experience this um, enhancement to the statue? Like, what was that like? You know, I wish I had spent more time and just like watched reactions, but it was like my senior year and I was very busy. So I just sort of put them up. <laughs> no one would take them down but uh, the 2022 yeah. version might have like a QR code or something right where they right <laughs> there you go <laughs> I love that I love how rogue it was too um so that was wonderful and this um is maybe part of that casting kind of narrative you're talking about earlier right what yeah. is this piece yeah so this is a piece that I did with a friend of mine I was again thinking about the female body um and sort of traveling through time with that and how we sort of experience time, push back against time. So a friend of mine um, allowed me to cast her um, every day for a month. Um, so this is sort of a, a calendar representation, I guess, of her body um, traveling through that, that period of time. And I was just, yeah, wanting to kind of make that experience like tactile or sculptural, um, the sense of these like 
you know, minute changes, but also like no change at all, honestly. Um, and so, yeah, I guess, again, just wanting to kind of like make these emotional or um, theoretical things like much more experiential and tactile is interesting to me. And also just kind of spoke to this time in my life where you sort of have these intimate um, or cl really close relationships with, with other women in college, or at least I did uh, just again, leaning into that idea of friendship. And, and this piece almost became about this like performative experience of like laying the plaster on her every day, which, you know, is a very, can be a very claustrophobic experience. And so it did almost become like a moment of spirituality, like within our day where we sort of quieted down and, you know, she spent 20 to 30 minutes sort of submerged in plaster, which was like a very generous, generous thing for her to do and kind of created this point of connection. So I still have some of these pieces um, in my home and and it's lovely to have that that kind of connection to a friend. Yeah, I do think that is um, pretty much as intimate as it gets maybe to let someone do this thing that could suffocate you, it feels like. Right, that. at least you have a little straw, yeah, so. Oh my gosh, I don't know if I would be the friend for that. I'm really scared <laughs> of small spaces, but but that's amazing. And I, I'm sure, I mean, she wasn't able to talk while this was happening, right? So you, it really was. No, so it was, a, yeah, it was a quiet, yeah. It was a very sort of meditative and quiet time. Oh my gosh. I'm picturing there's like that thing of like, if you look in someone's eyes for like a minute without talking, like that's a very intimate experience, but this is like next level, I think. <laughs> like let someone cover you yeah. in plaster every day for a month and see how your relationship changes. <laughs> <It's> very special. <laughs> yeah. I remember her boyfriend at the time coming and just being like totally mystified. Like, Why are you doing this to my girlfriend? <laughs> like, you know, it's <laughs> <laughs> I think she enjoyed it. I don't know. I yeah. Again, it was very generous of her. Yeah. Um. I remember you saying um a little bit ago with architecture, right? The negative spaces and understanding those too. I feel like on the flip side of these sculptured, it, it'd be cool to have her like a written word about like being inside the plastic, right? Like what an interesting yeah. counterbalance. Maybe um we'll have to circle back with her one day. <laughs> <laughs> it's true. You can interview her next for her perspective. Right? There we go. Um <laughs> she's part of the performance. Um but I also love just um how impactful this is in the space. Like I remember in the business world learning about how if you have data like how you present it matters for how people feel it right and so if mm -hmm. I want to convey that I've sent 25 emails and got no response I could write the word number 25 or I could show all the dates and times that I emailed mm -hmm. someone and so this to me just it really occupies a lot like 30 days maybe feel like nothing in the grand scheme of our lives but it's traveling through this space and this body is evolving and living in each of those moments I think it's um really beautiful well thank you so I can't wait to hear more about this. <laughs> and this is like per further in the future now, like how far is this piece from that last one we looked at? Oh gosh, this is like 15 years later. So this is a, this is a jump. Um, yeah, so this is just two years ago, like the beginning of the pandemic, um, we were, um, doing a home renovation process. We lived in a, a camper that you can see in the lower right-hand corner uh, for two years, a little oh. family. And that was a, a really intense like spatial experience. <laughs> um, but also just this piece was about kind of allowing my, so this was, I call these like little mini performances that I documented during, um, sort of lockdown um, period of COVID. And I like as a mother, as a caregiver, I really try to hold myself together emotionally so that I can provide for the needs of my family. Um, and I just found that like what was being asked of me and of like caregivers in general in society at this moment felt just overwhelming, absurd, like almost comically absurd, which is what I kind of wanted to lean into with this was just to like take a moment out of my day and like allow myself to speak to like what it actually felt like physically to be in this space at this time which was just an overwhelming feeling of exhaustion and it was really it was really cathartic to climb on top of the roof and just lay there <laughs> for several minutes 
um, yeah, so just kind of breaking out of this, like the monotony of the day to day to really like give place and time to like how I was feeling emotionally. So this was just a very like intuitive, like I'm just going to kind of express how I feel in this space at this moment um, through this series of images and um, and performances. And so, yeah, I it kind of gave me um, like a connection back into art making because I, you know, it had been like a, several months of just not doing much because there just wasn't the time or the, um, you know, many factors. But yeah, so this, I was really, really grateful for the, the opportunity to just like speak honestly in these like little, little moments about, about what, what I felt like emotionally. So yeah. I love your titling of things too, right? This series is she's on top of things and it just, um, it makes me smile, but I'm like, cause I get it. Like it was so, such a hard time. And I imagine as a caregiver, just even more absurd and, and difficult and heavy and, um, I think that that organic nature of this to just decide you're going to go out there um, and do it is wonderful. Did this get to, how did this get displayed? Did it, did it, and it seems like maybe you didn't care about it, right? Like the kind of the drone experience, but at a different time and place. Um, I'd love to hear more. You know, I haven't actually um, displayed this work. Um, so I have done some prints, but I haven't shown them anywhere. So it, it really just kind of lived as like, a moment of digital connection at the time. Um, but yeah, again, I, I'm working on being more, more thoughtful about <laughs> that sort of documentation and, and doing out. That's not, not my forte, but I'm looking to get better at those things of sort of like, yeah, making it feel a little bit more accessible um, versus just these like domestic projects that you can do that no one knows about so um yeah still kind of navigating that space but but yeah it was something that I just shared um digitally online yeah I think it's really um special on the flip side of that though that you don't get hung up in that kind of side of it it seems like this was really um therapeutic in its own right just to do it um and for that to be the place to start seems like a great place <laughs> to sure. start um so that's that's beautiful um okay I've seen this one before and I am so glad that I get to talk to you about it today because I'm so curious yeah so this is another um piece that kind of evolved out of like the time of the pandemic and I spent a lot of time um thankfully in Arkansas like the trails were still open even during like the heart of it because there just weren't that many people out and about so I, I went on a lot of walks um, just on the mountain biking trails around my house and um, really sort of felt this sense of like, and I, I think for a lot of people, we felt this sense of time slowing down and sort of connecting to like the seasonal changes in the trees, um, like watching them evolve over the course of that spring of 2020. Um, I started to really feel this like strong connection to the understory trees. Um, there's in Arkansas, there's a like flowering canopy um, within the understory. So you get like the red buds, the pawpaws, the um, just um, the dogwoods, these beautiful sort of colors that emerge under this like larger, you know, canopy. And, and again, like as with so many of my projects, like tying it back to gender and thinking about like existing within larger structures is not of your making, you know, like the sort of patriarchal um, structures that we all navigate um, day to day and just feeling the sense of connection to these small moments of like beauty um, from these flowering trees. And so that's where the sort of colors came from that I selected. Um, so I wanted to play around with like the scale of the human body and kind of sort of blow it up to the size of these trees. Um, so I began like thinking of like sewing these garments that allowed the female body to sort of grow in its scale um, to really just connect spatially with, um, with that sort of ecology and landscape that was, that I felt drawn to. So, and then also um, I'll get these ideas and then I'll just like sit and sew for like, 
three months. <laughs> and that's, that, that's also sort of a part of the performative process for me is like the beauty of like these manual labor that um, happens over time, uh, something that I'm really drawn to. So in sewing all of these kind of ruffled forms, um, you know, it was just a huge investment of, of time and effort, but um, then bringing together a group of female artists that I really admire and just saying, you know, will you come out into this landscape and sort of play around with me? It feels a little bit like, you know, the alchemy of like printmaking or something where you sort of throw a bunch of ingredients together and see like, what can this be? Um, so that is also something that I really love about, um, you know, performative work. I like that tension between sort of planning things out versus just allowing, you know, the moment and the time to like, to direct you. And so we did just a series of photographs. Um, and then um, we also did a performance that we, um, that we filmed. Um, and so, yeah, it was just, again, a, an opportunity to explore the, and I guess this is a little bit of a, a, a turn for me away from like, um, man-made structures to like thinking about how the female body connects um, with a more natural environment. Although even as I say that, like I've always been sort of hyper aware of like the way that we sort of landscape our, our natural environments as well. Um, and um, yeah, just kind of, I think that's from growing up in Santa Barbara where everything is just very, like there's a lot of perfection happening in the, in the ecology um, there. And so, yeah, just sort of questioning like what is natural. Um, but yeah, so this again was about um, just that initial like feeling of um, of connection to these understory trees and kind of wanting to expand on that and explore that a little further. What a special way to explore that. You mentioned that um, these were female artists that you admired. Did you know them as well or were they strangers? What was it like to reach out and ask to participate in this? <laughs> right, yeah. So. Um, so I work at Crystal Bridges um, within the education department. And so these are all um, artists that I either work with at the museum. Kim Lee is in the video department. Um, but she's also a photographer, um, collage artist, painter. And then um, Kaylin Barnofsky is um, a singer songwriter, printmaker, um, text based artist um, who we had worked with in our um, arts and social impact program, which is like a series of artist residencies. So she was one of our artist residents that I'd worked with. And then Leah, um, we had worked with um, in some programs as well at the museum. So these were just artists that I kind of met in my, in my job. Um, that is kind of a lovely part of, of working at a museum is that, you know, it could be someone in the communications department, the prep team, a lot of people are artists, um, you know, they have an MFA and, and, you know, we're all sort of having our, our, our day job <laughs> within the arts, but it is lovely to kind of connect to those, um, to that creative side. And so, yeah, I really, I really appreciated that sense of community that I've, that I've had from um, working at the museum, which has been nice. That's beautiful. Um, and so you kind of reached out to them and you said, I'm going to go into the woods with these outfits that I made. Do you want to join me? Pretty much. Yeah. No, I'm, I'm pretty good at the cold call of like, Hey, I've been thinking of this. <laughs> what do you That's think? Such a I, part, right? <laughs> yeah. For the most part, I think people are like excited to have something out of their like normal day-to-day -day routine. You know, it's, you know, often get asked to just do something that's not like and I don't ever want it to feel extractive. So I did, I did actually like pay them for their participation in this. Um, so, I mean, those collaborations can be, it's something to navigate in terms of like not wanting to take advantage of people's, you know, generosity, but, um, but have it feel reciprocal and have them, like I always, in working with other artists, uh, I want them to have like a, you know, creative, um, input and I want it to feel collaborative. So, so that is why, like, you know, it wasn't just about a female figure. It was about like a female as like creator or, you know, someone that, that I think 
that I was excited to see like what they would bring to this experience. So yeah. I love that. I love that you mentioned that, um, you know, paying people for their time kind of element that sometimes gets overlooked. I think that's really important. And um, so these people had some creative role in the photos and the performance that happened. Do you remember any like special moments or things that people did that you're like, I would have never kind of came up with that. Or even just, you know, in the photo on the left, you have the yellow kind of sacheting. And um, I, I just would love to hear any inside scoop that you had from this experience. Yeah, no, I think we definitely got um, a lot of feedback from Cynthia, who was, um, Cynthia post was the photographer for this. So that was lovely to kind of have her um, thoughts and ideas, but I really like left the movement of the end of it. it was kind of interesting to see where people took took that and then also like within the performance itself um just uh, worked with Kaylin to to create a soundtrack um of a kind of sort of sonic experience that was all about like the landscape sort of speaking for itself um in some ways like channeling that sound of of the landscape, which was really like a lovely, beautiful thing to kind of then allow that music to inform the way that we move through the space. So she recorded the um, the audio and then we all like during the performance, we just like played it live. Um, and so, yeah, that was a, a lovely point of like allowing like that back and forth to sort of change each subsequent layer of activity. Um, yeah, so I've really, I've really enjoyed like connecting that sort of um, sonic experience a little more purposefully. That was something that has just happened in the last few years of bringing in that that component, and and it's kind of opened up a new world for me of like um, yeah, just spatial possibilities. Um, thinking about the sound. Yeah, um, I love that term, the sonic experience. I think like in um, the world of marketing and stuff, we talk about you know, the music you play in a store shapes how people linger or they run through, right? And so this in a much um, different sphere, I think achieves that same kind of goal of shaping the space like you're talking about, which is awesome. Um, okay, so the last one we have here is some of the cozies, as I understand. And then on the left side is an actual building situation in Springdale, right? I'm so excited to hear about these. <laughs> well, I love the term building situation. Um, <laughs> that probably sums it up. Um, yeah, so <laughs> I'm just began thinking about like utilizing these materials from inside of a domestic space, almost starting off with like a bed skirt, the sort of like decorative element that we use to like hide things we don't want to see and sort of bringing those to the fore like um, almost bringing that softness outside and like claiming that as like a, a structural priority almost um, and then with the colors just sort of leaning into I don't know I like in doing historical research it can be a real um, a really depressing read like so much of human history is like just stories of suffering and persecution and so trying to come out of that and move forward with a sense of like radical joy I would say um, is something that I've kind of really sort of tried to um, to shift towards in my recent work is like offering moments of joy and catharsis through color and um, that that is how I experienced this. Um, a lot of these colors are also inspired by like Peruvian textiles. Um, that's where my family is from. And so just living with those in my home and um, as something that has sort of seeped into my work. But so the, the cozy is kind of taken from like a, a teapot cozy, these sort of like warm items that, that cover the exterior of the structure. And so it's just started playing around with looking at like vernacular architecture in Arkansas and imagining imagining this sort of interior life brought to the fore because you know humans are dynamic and bizarre and colorful creatures but I don't think that our exterior architecture speaks to that in any way um right it's a lot of just sort of um yeah a monolithic point of view a lot of times and so it doesn't 
often speak to the range of human emotion and experience. And so the piece on the left was an installation that I did in Springdale for um, one month. And that was the summer of 2021 um, as part of like the Interform like art exhibition. And again, like researching the town of Springdale, which is a place that, that I love. I have spent a lot of time there just um, getting to know community organizers there um, and I just find it to be a place where people are really invested in shaping their community at a grassroots level which I love um, but again in doing the research just um, learned a lot about like you know the historical racism um, that existed within that town and and just kind of grappling like what does that mean and how do we how do we acknowledge that how do we move forward from that um, in a, a generative way and I came across a, a quote by um, Joan Didion where she says that like a place belongs forever um, to whoever loves it so radically that they remake it in their own image. And so again, just th that phrase, those words of this idea of like remaking a place through radical love um, was the starting point for this. So I started thinking about an Arkansas sunrise, these sort of bright colors of like a new day, a new opportunity for you, like as a community member to shape the space that you live in. Um, and just, again, maybe offer offer a moment of joy to the passerby. Um, like, I, I love architecture that feels generous, that feels like it's really engaging with the human body, engaging with people in a way that that is giving. Um, so, yeah. And Amber, this is Amber Paradin's studio, and she's just like oh, the yeah. archetype for the giving human. So, yeah. like, just her generosity and saying, "Yes, you can like attach this fabric to the outside of my building." Like, that's a generous act. Not everyone says yes to that. So, but Amber definitely would. That's such a special partnership that came from this um, opportunity, and the colors are so um, perfect. I feel like, and it's so lovely, and um, I feel like it is. Um, you know, some people have those homes where you feel like you could just come in at any time and have a cookie and sit on the couch. <laughs> and I, I feel like I would be more willing or um, less worried maybe about walking up to this building and be like, what's going on here? Like, I am so curious and I expect you to be very friendly. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, no, it was lovely to install the piece and just have like, you know, community members driving past, like, come on, what is this? You know, just that sense of connection to people was really lovely. I, I like, you know, spurring those questions of like, what are you doing? And, um, you know, we got some honks, some thumbs ups, like, great. Oh <laughs> I don't know. Yeah, I just, I really enjoyed the sense of community that I, I feel in Springdale. So it was lovely to be able to, to do this piece there. Yes, it will always have a very special place in my heart too, as you know. Um, but I'm so glad we got to go through some of those. I wonder too, so with the one that we just saw on the building, very different from the performance piece, like what are the timelines like when you're working on these things? I imagine they vary a bit or maybe they don't. Are you very like operations? It's always going to take the same kind of process. What's that like? Yeah, so it can depending on the project, like the performance that I did in um, Nevada, that was like two years in the making. It was a long, long process of um, just getting the funding, first of all, um, and then like the actual like physical making of the object. So I made like a 30 foot long quilted backpack and just piecing together and working on that was, it was a huge endeavor. Um, I really just, like my art making is like the expandable foam that I sort of insert into like the spare time in my life <laughs> so um yeah that sometimes constrains like my timelines as well but then like the piece in Springdale sometimes I'll see you know a call for artists and um and I think that one was created in like six weeks which is a little bit of a an intense timeline for doing a large-scale public art piece I I do usually like to have spent like a good amount of time in the space, like at least maybe six months um, to do that research, to, to have that sense of connection to place. Um, but for that one, it, I mean, it, it ended up feeling great. It was almost like a, a gesture drawing, like writ large. <laughs> I was like, this feels right. I'm just gonna go with it. And so, yeah, I think it can be, it can be nice to have both. It can be nice to have the 
the lengthy time periods where you can evolve it slowly and methodically, but then sometimes when you need to get, you know, not out of a rut, but sometimes it can be nice to just have a quick like experiential moment of like, I'm just going to go with my first thought on this and it's, you know, it's up for a month. We'll see how it goes. So, so I think I, I do both, but, but yeah, typically for large scale art, it is nice to have like a generous timeline for fabrication. Yeah. And you mentioned the other research part of this always being important, but it may be taking different forms for different projects. Is there anything that's consistent in your research, like a human part of it or a literature part of it, or I don't know, um, whatever it may be? Yeah. Well, that's interesting that you bring up literature because there is often an overlap. I'm someone that like, I sort of toggle back and forth between like first person, like you know, nonfiction narratives, and but then also love, um, you know, contemporary literature. And that's something that does like also bleed into the work that I do um, as well. Like I, as I was thinking about like the female body and relating to home, I was reading a lot of like Rachel Cusk and um, other artists that kind of engage with like, um, yeah, the emotional experience of the, the female body and its relationship to domestic spaces. Um, so yeah, I think both of those are starting points. Um, again, just sort of whatever I'm like internalizing at that moment, which is a lot of, of reading. Um, but also then just it can be, it can be experiential as well. It can be, you know, being in the space and something sort of serendipitous happening within that. So like this, the Jones Center project, I was at a, a community festival. Um, the Arkansas Festival, um, watching the Ballet Folklorico dresses and just sort of became mesmerized with this like ribbon-like form of the, the skirts um, and watching, because they're usually like have this ribbon detailing along the bottom. And so that eventually like became the form that I sort of referenced in the artwork was this ribbon like bending through space. Um, so yeah, I think it's it's often a combination of those things of like, the physicality, but also the um, the research and just the um, maybe maybe just where I'm at emotionally too <laughs> probably has a bigger impact. <laughs> yes, um, in social work, when we think about research, right? There's maybe this academic view that the researcher is unbiased and just completely neutral, but I think there is always that emotional element. Like for us, rather than act like we don't have humanity, <laughs> we just put our humanity in the front. Like this is what we're going through. This is what we are. And this is how right. it, this is going to shape what we're doing. And it sounds like you take that into account of where you're at um, when you're doing the work, which I think is really valid and important and, and lovely. Um, so <laughs> you mentioned kind of Crystal Bridges being part of your story. You do community engagement work there. I'm curious mm -hmm. about how, if at all, that um, connects with your personal artistic development or what it means for you to be a resident of Arkansas, an employee of Crystal Bridges and an artist at the same time. Oh, um, yeah, that's a great question. It's so it has given me um, like working at Crystal Bridges has really allowed me to kind of connect to a larger artist community. Um, again, like being within that sort of isolated domestic space, like prior to moving here um, with my young kids, um, it sort of allowed me like a window out into that world because I wasn't someone that was able to like go to a lot of gallery openings or things like that so it, this allowed me to connect with artists you know nine to five during the day which was really important to me um, and then I would say specifically like moving into the community work um, which I did in the last year um, has really just allowed me the opportunity to to listen to grow um, through relationships with um, people that are really doing the hard work of um, impacting their community in meaningful ways. Um, so we work with the Arkansas Coalition of Marshallese, which is just um, for me, like the standard bearer of um, dynamic women, like putting in, you know, the day-to-day -day effort to, you know, create substantive policy changes that um, impact their community for the better. Like they, they were able to like help push through a bipartisan healthcare um, bill during COVID, which I mean, that's incredible. Like, especially in the political climate that we're in now to see this grassroots organization bring people from across the aisle to, um, 
to support um, these measures that would help their community members. So just really a lot of um, just trying to take in as much as I can and then offer, you know, whatever the museum can in terms of like, you know, a microphone or like, um, you know, any sort of support to highlight the great work that they're doing within the community. So I've been super grateful to be able to um, just, yeah, engage with those those people that are working so hard within their communities, that's felt like a real gift. Um, but most of the time I'm just sending emails, so I don't want to <laughs> make it sound super It's glamorous. always a less glamorous side. It is a job, yeah. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> yeah but, but occasionally there are moments of joy. <laughs> yes, and those emails lead us to those moments of joy. Maybe they wouldn't happen without Ideally. all the back and forth that <laughs> that, that is necessary <laughs> in any system. So um, it makes sense. Um, as we wrap up, I have a few more like rapid fire kind of just direct questions. So. Um, First, like, why is exploring what lies underneath the surface of domesticity matter? What keeps inspiring and motivating you toward this subject and your work? Right. Well, I mean, I think as we've seen in the last week, um, issues related to gender are inequality in that sphere are still just, we have a long way to go. And um, yeah, I just, I found that as a mother, um, so much of your of our experiences are easily dismissed. Um, and um, yeah, just as a woman navigating the world and the space, it's I think important to highlight those things and to have a, a more open dialogue about that experience so that it is less um, like hidden, I guess. And so that really is kind of um, what leads me to want to bring that to the forefront and honor that work and honor that caregiving that is so often associated with um, femininity as something that is worthwhile um, and to be valued. Yeah, I love that. Um, are there any lessons you've learned along the way, pieces of, of wisdom that you think would be helpful to anyone else trying to learn more, um, trying to create themselves, trying to raise awareness for something, anything like that? Yeah, um, I guess one thing that's um, that I think has maybe like served me well is just the ability to be open to change. Um, you know, it is it is so hard to step away from from sort of structures or things that we're presented with early in our life that um, you know in some ways empower us and in other ways constrain us. And so I think just just being open to that notion that um, that we can continue to change throughout our lives. I love. I love the stories of like, um, you know, older women that um, that continue to evolve. Like all of Kittredge is one of my favorite novels because it is the story of this, you know, curmudgeonly older woman who really gains a sense of understanding and growth um, later in life. And so I think that's something that I try to strive for is to just never stop changing, never stop growing, um, even though it can be hard. Um, so yeah, just meaning and notion that it's never too late to sort of reinvent oneself and your priorities. So true. Um, I will be taking that with me. So thank you. Um, and finally, Danielle, what do you want people to leave knowing about you and your work? And what are you looking forward to right now? Well, I would say, gosh, about me, um, that I, I mean, I don't know that I want that I care that people know anything about me <laughs> per se. <laughs> um, but what I did about, I'm excited about, um, I'm working with three other um, individuals on a, a project in Springdale that explores like gender in public space. And we've sort of built out a timeline where we're gonna be meeting for dinner um, once a month to discuss the process. And so I'm really excited about like having a group of individuals that like engages with each other in a generous way and I'm excited about trying to be a better community member um, and a more like concerned and active citizen so those are things that I'm looking forward to and um, yeah just really grateful for this chance to, to chat with you today I wish I could ask you a few questions now so <laughs> less love we'll have to keep going maybe every few months our own dinner I would be honored um i'm up for it yeah 
Good. And I think, you know, the things you're looking forward to say a lot about who you are that is, is going to stick with people and be really meaningful. So it's been such an honor to get to speak with you today, Danielle, and start this friendship. I'm really glad to know you and glad to share your story with this little corner of the world. So thank you again. Thank you so much, Kara. This was lovely.